So welcome everyone um, and thank you very much for joining me and thank you Lean Frontiers for providing this vehicle for this webinar. So which step in the improvement carter has most impact on a successful outcome is the question. I guess when I was putting this together, one of the first things I needed to define, <clears throat> excuse me, was what do we mean by a successful outcome? Uh, if I don't define that, it could be quite misleading. So a successful outcome in this case, is when the practice of the improvement carter has moved a step closer to thinking scientifically innately. So in the purpose of the improvement carter, the pattern of the improvement carter, is an, an, uh, eventually to have a practice of the improvement carter thinking scientifically. So we're getting a successful, out, successful outcome when someone has moved closer to that. So points of introduction before I get into the main part of it, and those of you who have heard me speak will have heard uh, some of this before, but I think it's important to get this little bit of a level set, uh, and I'll move reasonably quickly through this. Scientific thinking is a mental framework for approaching goals and obstacles or problems. It's a continuous comparison between what we predict will happen next, seeing what actually happens, and adjusting our understanding and actions based on what we learn from the difference, from any difference. Now, just a point there, there's a terrific uh, lean post uh, that Jeff Like has put out that illustrates the relationship between Toyota Way and the Toyota Carter, where patterns where he talks about that really the link between Toyota Way and scientific thinking. So it's about for five minutes read, um, well worth a read um, if you go to that blog, well worth it. So why and uh, so the further the question is the further question is why develop our scientific thinking capabilities because right now we are less sure than ever of what the future looks like overall. So you know, twenty or thirty years ago we were a fair way back from that corner in the path. We could see the road ahead. The corner was a long way off. You could argue even we didn't have to worry about the corner. But now that isn't the case. You know, now we're a lot closer to that corner in the path, and we cannot see around the bend. Therefore. The most success is going to come to, come to those who are best at adapting. When they move around the bend and they discover what's there, uh, the most success will come to those who are best at adapting. But just to take that a little bit further, imagine you're on this bus, this transfer bus at the airport. I think you're, a lot of people will be familiar with these. That bus is about to turn left, or imagine it was about to turn left around the corner and you're standing up, what would you do? Now, what you would very likely either already be holding onto that handle or you would grab onto that handle. Now, scientific thinking is a little bit the same. We want people to think scientifically because it's the way to navigate uncertainty within, with surety. So there's some uncertainty coming as that bus goes around the corner. <clears throat> so we grab that handle to hold our balance. Scientific thinking is the same or thinking scientifically is the same. It's the way to navigate uncertainty with surety. That's why we need to develop our scientific thinking capabilities because there's a fair bit of lack of surety or uncertainty, sorry, there's a fair bit of uncertainty and the road ahead as the last sort of couple of years have demonstrated particularly. And the second, uh, another thing is that I don't think we should ever lose sight of and I remind people whenever I get the opportunity and here's an opportunity is the two research questions that started all our discussions around the Toyota Carter patterns. And these are the questions that drove Mike Rother in doing his research, which led to the first book in 2009. I don't think we should ever lose sight of these. The first one was, what are the unseen managerial routines and thinking that lie behind Toyota's success with continuous improvement and adaptation? Now, what he identified was the less visible stuff, systematic scientific way of thinking and acting and managers as teachers of that way. And no offense to Mike and he and I have talked about this and he actually comments very early in that 2009 book. He wasn't the first to note this. Spear and Bowen wrote an article in 1999 in the Harvard Business Review about the DNA of Toyota. They made specific reference to uh, Toyota developing a community of scientists. So they uh, identified this and to, some, to, um, to a certain extent others had too. So had Mike left it there, it wouldn't have been anything really new to us. But what he did, which, which was terrific and uh, was a benefit to all of us, was had a second research question. How can other companies develop similar routines and thinking in their organizations? If the answer to that question, not the first, the answer to the second was the two Carter, the improvement Carter and the coaching Carter. And the improvement Carter, if we practice it enough, will help us develop that systematic scientific way of thinking and acting. And if we practice the coaching Carter enough, it'll help us become teachers of that way. 
So just to be clear, two research questions that was the answer to the secondary question, second question, which gave birth to the two carta, was not the answer to the first question. Now, in this discussion, we're focusing on that first one, the improvement carta, and the systematic scientific way of thinking and acting. So here is the improvement carta. I won't go into this in a lot of detail. Four steps, get the direction or challenge, establish a next target condition. Uh, sorry, get the direction or challenge first. Second, grasp the current condition. Third, establish a next target condition. And four, conduct experiments to get there. Now, a number of you submitted questions and I've got them a list in front of me here when you registered. And Peter, you, um, Peter Ramsden said, asked a question, is it important to explain the IK process, improvement cutter process and give it names, or is it better to, ju to just start and do it? Good question and one we get asked quite a bit. There's a, Mark Rosenthal's done a, um, a blog on his uh, video about 30 minutes on the, uh, on his Lean Thinker website, <clears throat> where he talks about the need, uh, the, the importance of giving, giving names to practice patterns or titling practice patterns. And what he says, and I haven't, uh, I have no reason to question this, that if we have conscious awareness of the patterns we are practicing, we're more likely to develop them innately. So if we have conscious awareness of the patterns we're practicing, uh, we're more likely that we'll develop the innate behaviors quicker. So um, I think what I believe is that the naming of, it makes sense to me that the naming of the four steps helps develop conscious awareness. And what we're consciously aware of is a practice pattern. I think that's really important. We're consciously aware of the steps of our practice pattern because what we don't want to fall into the trap of thinking is that what we have here is an improvement method. It's not. And this is one of the reasons or one of the where things get a bit off the rails with the Toyota Carter patterns is they're seen as an improvement method. They're not. They're a practice pattern for starting to learn scientific thinking. Um, so, Peter, I hope, trust that helps a little bit with your question there. So, getting our direction or challenge, let's look at the four steps very quickly. Getting a direction or challenge, a customer oriented destination, these are the, some of the criteria. Nearly always two or more measurable, measurable aspects, which are often balancing. How to get there is not stated, as you don't know. You shouldn't know. If it is, it's not a challenge. If you do, it's not a challenge and includes a by when date. So, for example, in our little restaurant example I'm going to show you here, uh, a challenge may well be by December the 20th, 2021, we'll have minimum 95% satisfaction score from diners with two sittings on every table every night and no reduction in profit per diner. So that statement there covers all of those four bullet points. Now, Cathy, you asked the question uh, when you registered and it was, um, do you have any suggestions on how to use Carter in a law firm uh, environment? That's not a, something I'm going to cover right now uh, in detail, but one of the things that is uh, a, a really critical prerequisite is that you're very clear on what the deliverable is to your customer and what they value in that deliverable. So uh, if, if that's, if that's uh, and that's always a little bit harder in a service organisation than in a manufacturing organisation. So I guess the question I'd ask back is how clear are you on that? And happy to discuss this via email if you like, if you want to contact me, Cathy, um, at the end. But a real important step is you've got to be very clear on your de deliverable, <clears throat> what the customer values in that deliverable before you can go too far with this. So I'd, I'd be asking that question first as a law firm, as a deliverer of a service, how clear are we on that? All right, second step of the improvement card is we grasp the current condition. Where are we now, what we have, and observing and noting what is actually happening and gathering data. Facts and data, not just data alone. So you can see at the top left of this slide, I've got a picture of some data, but also a picture of some of the facts that are giving rise to the data. So important to realize that it's not the current condition, we won't have the whole story if we've only got data alone. If we have the facts that go with it, the data, facts and data, we're going to uh, have done a much better job of grasping the current condition. Then we establish our next target condition. Uh, what are target conditions? They're markers along the way to our challenge or goal. Each marker represents the way you need the system to be working at that point, and we're beyond our knowledge threshold. So, for example, a target condition based on the challenge and current condition that I just showed, thinking about the restaurant as, as an example. A, a, a target condition that 
covers the uh, essentials or the criteria and shows a um, outcome metric, waiting staff approaching the table and leaving only once in the process of turning the table around, giving a turnaround time of three minutes by 15th of September. So there's an example of a target condition in our restaurant case. And then the fourth step of the improvement carter, we conduct experiments. And it's a plan, do, check, adjust cycle, plan and do highlighted yellow or on the left, what we will do, what, pardon me, what we will do, what we will measure, what do we predict based on what we do, and then we do it and we watch closely. That's the first two steps of the experimental PDCA cycle. And then after we've done the last two, in yellow on the right, check and then adjust. What happened compared to your prediction? What was learned? And given what was learned, what will you do next? The most important question of the step four of the improvement carter, given what was learned, what will you do next? That's essentially what it's all about and what we're leading towards. All right, so that's an overview uh, of the improvement carter and the four steps. Now, let me look, I've now got to the point of this um, discussion or this uh, webinar. And let me talk about some of the mistakes and learnings we've had, um, Ben and I in particular, my business partner, Ben Chopping, over the last sort of five, oh, probably since 2013, 14 onward. One of the first thing, probably the biggest thing was we were, in the early days, we were establishing our next target. We weren't establishing our next, our next target condition. We were certainly establishing our next target. So in that restaurant example, what we would have had back then, and we knew we were on the wrong track and didn't really know why, it just didn't feel right, um, was we would have just had our target is a turnaround time of three minutes by the 15th of September. That's what we would have had back then, and that's where we were. And then we um, realised that what we weren't, uh, so what, what was causing that, we were tending to grasp data only. So we thought we were grasping the current condition by grasping data only. So we, essentially what we were doing was we were asking ourselves, where are we now, what we have, and we were gathering data. We weren't interested, we weren't observing and noting, we weren't doing a good job of that, we weren't getting the facts, we weren't asking ourselves, you know, what would your customer want us to notice? We weren't asking those questions. We were tending to da grasp data only. Now, I sort of I stressed it on slide, uh, that slide where I introduced current condition, but more strongly now, what we real when we started to realize that's what the problem was, then the question was, why were we doing that? The reason was we were focusing only on data. We needed to get the facts as well. So data is just a product of something that's happening. You know, if nothing's happening, we won't have data. If, if nothing's happening, if the space is empty, then we can't have data. Uh, we won't have it. So um, really the facts come first. The data is just a product of the facts. So if you don't have the facts that are contributing to the data, you don't have the whole story. You won't have fully grasped the current condition. So, you know, we had the data on the left. Here are the facts on the right. We went to the, the we noted that went to the, the um, staff were going to the table three times after someone had left. Used three different tubs for plates and cutlery. Clearing started 1.5 minutes after the diners left, et cetera, et cetera. These are the facts that were giving rise to the data. So another way of looking at it is these are the, the conditions are on the right. As a consequence of these conditions, we have data. So the data reflects the conditions. Depending on the conditions, the data will vary. So really important to get the data and the facts. So grasping the current condition is about observing and noting what is actually happening and gathering the data. Um, as, and in also including the facts or the conditions. And what would we want the customer to notice is a great question that can help you there. The important point here is we're getting the conditions. The conditions give rise to the data. We need to be really clear on that. So it was when sort of that dawned on us to really hone in on that, that I sort of understood why the Japanese always say, go and stand in the circle, go and stand in the circle. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, that's, makes a, that sounds like a good idea, but I, I guess I wasn't, I wasn't making the connection in my mind as to the value of standing in the circle. The value of standing in the circle is so we have the conditions uh, which allow us to understand why the data is showing what it's, what it's showing. Now, Sean Shepard, you asked the question when you registered, <clears throat> how do you get people to focus more on the condition part of the target condition? Now, I'm coming to that, but if we focus on the conditions as they are now, 
that allows us to be, and you'll see what coming up on the second slide, it allows, the next slide allows us to focus on the, the target uh, part of that. So how do we get people to focus more on the condition part of the target condition is about to pop up. So if, Sean, if you are clear on the current conditions, a condition to target becomes easier to identify. So if you haven't got the conditions, you can't do what's up on the slide here. But if you are clear on the current conditions, a condition to target becomes much easier to identify. All right, we're going to target. In this case, we're going to target the fact they went to the table three times. That's the main one. It's going to pull in others. That's the main one we're going to target. Now, once we target that, and that's the condition we're going to target, we can then predict the impact of this on the data, which is our outcome metric. Remember, a target condition should include an outcome metric. So if we target this condition, we can then predict the impact of this on the data. That allows us to get to this statement that I showed earlier on, waiting staff approach the table and leave only once in the process of turning the table around. There's the condition we're going to target, giving a turnaround time of three minutes. That's the outcome metric. <clears throat> that will be the reflection in the data. So this was our biggest learning, um, is that if we focus really strongly on uh, understanding the conditions that gave rise to the data, then we can determine condition, uh, conditions to target and attach the outcome metric to that, which is the number, if you like. That allows us to develop a, target con a um, condition to target, like waiting staff approach the table and leave only once in the process of turning the table around. So, um, Sean, that question you asked, how do you get people to focus more on the condition part of the target condition, is, is get them to focus on the condition when they uh, really truly understand that when, uh, when, they're, when they're grasping current condition. I trust that makes sense. Now, I'm reading a book at the moment by um, Sir Alex Ferguson, uh, uh, who was a the manager of Manchester United, one of the most famous sporting teams in the world, most successful and famous sporting teams in the world. He was manager for a long time. And in the book, he talks about <laughs> observations and the value he got about through observations. One of the things he says in there, and I really like it, he says, believe what your eyes see. And I think that's so many times, you know, our eyes see something, but our biases uh, allow us to write down or observe something else. He writes, he, his note was, believe what your eyes see. Uh, just when you're standing in that circle there and observing, just write down what your eyes see. No interpretation of it, not yours or anyone else's, just write down what your eyes see. So I trust that might help. And there's a couple of other questions that came in. Just need to grab a drink, excuse me. So Sam Wagner, when you registered, uh, sorry, Sam Prego, when you registered, you said, please provide practical takeaways that can be applied right, right away. So there's that, believe what your eyes see, I think is very important. Write down what your eyes see, not your interpretation of it, but what your eyes see. And also um, the, the thought of focusing on the conditions when we're grasping current condition and really being clear on those and how they're um, contributing to the data will allow you to set a condition to target. So Sam, Prego, trust that helps. Jim uh, Andrew, Andrusik, sorry if I mispronounce your name, who should be deciding what the target condition should be? Uh, the people working, the people, the leader, the team leader and the people working on the process should be uh, doing the deciding, but they do need to be guided by someone who's experienced in setting target conditions, a coach um, or a manager who understands what a target condition is. They will need to be guided by them, but they need to uh, be involved in it and they need to, uh, it really needs to be meaningful to them. They certainly should be involved in it and it needs to be made meaningful to them. The reality is if it's not, they won't strive for it. And here's the point with avoiding just numbers. People aren't motivated by numbers. So if we only set targets, my, my experience is it won't motivate people. And uh, Mallory Hartman, you asked, uh, let me go across, what's the best way to anchor a team around target conditions? Get them involved in it, focus on the conditions. Yes, we need the number in there, but numbers, the outcome metric. Teams won't, my experience is people won't be motivated by, motivated by numbers. So focus on the conditions and the condition we're going to target. I think that will help um, uh, get team buy-in. All right, so as I said, the most, uh, to, uh, to start, sorry, I said the most success will come to those who are best at adapting. Um, 
practicing these patterns well that I've just illustrated and picking up on a couple of the points I made from our learnings, particularly how we were struggling with the um, coming up with the target will help. Uh, and now once we focus on conditions, when we're grasping the current condition and then a condition that we can target certainly uh, helped us ourselves as a business become better at adapting and um, certainly feel that we're, help, we're better at helping others as a consequence of that. So some of the things I've said, this is, you know, this will be about 25 minutes and um, <clears throat> no doubt it hasn't answered all your questions. If there's a gap in your mind, there's an opportunity coming up for live Q&A. So it's Tuesday, August the 17th, so next week, 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If uh, you're interested in this and you register, please submit a question or your thoughts when registering. So I'll be facilitating this discussion, but I'll, I, I'm not going to be pushing the input. We really want you to pull the input. We want you to pull the discussion. That's why we want you to submit your question or thoughts when registering. It's going to be limited to 10 registrants, so we can cover uh, each piece of person's input, and it will be $50 per registration. So as soon as this webinar, webinar has finished, which is very shortly, Skylar is going to email anyone who is watching it live with the rego instructions um, uh, so you can re register immediately. As I said, it's maximum of 10, so we can keep the discussion nice and condensed. And it will be live, so there's plenty of interaction. So thank you very much for listening to the webinar. I appreciate it. If you want to email me about anything I said, then there's my email address bottom right. So uh, again, greatly appreciate it. Have a great afternoon and um, thank you.